to the 2014 Alfred and Shirley Wampler Caudell uh, Lecture in Consumer Affairs. This is our third annual lecture, um, and this lecture is possible because Don Caudell, who was a 1993 PhD graduate in the Department of Apparel, Housing, and Resource Management, uh, generously donated funds to endow, uh, to make this endowment of a lecture to honor his parents, Alfred and Shirley Wampler Caudell. Uh, and he did that because they were so supportive of his education and he wanted this opportunity. Dr. Caudell couldn't be with us today. He's, he's not feeling well, but usually he makes these events. He's currently a professor of marketing at Gardner Webb University. He's worked at various universities across the South teaching management, leadership, entrepreneurship, and e-business. He began his teaching career as an instructor of marketing at Virginia Tech. And in addition to his 29 years of teaching at the university le level, Dr. Caudell also worked in sales, retail management, advertising, and marketing research. He is also currently the editor of the Journal of Ethics and Entrepreneurship, and we're sorry that he cannot be with us today. Uh, but we'd like to thank him with a round of applause. And, and Our speaker today is Dr. Robert N. Mayer. He's a professor in the Department of Family and Consumer Studies at the University of Utah. He earned his PhD in sociology from the University of California at Berkeley and has since then been working in the consumer area. His research has exposed consumer, consumer problems, uh, evaluated consumer policy interventions, and examined the U.S. and global consumer movements. Dr. Mayer recently published the book Financial Justice, The People's Campaign to End Lender Abuse, and this was a uh, book that some of you that may have been in um, 4404 Consumer Protection last fall. This is one that you used. Um, he's also co-authored uh, the CFPB and Payday Lending, A New Agency, Old Problem, which is a forthcoming article in the Journal of Consumer Affairs. Dr. Mayer has been a board member of several of the consumer organizations, including the Consumer Federation of America, the National Consumer League. It's very appropriate that Dr. Mayer, a CFA board member and an American Council of Consumer Interest Distinguished Fellow, follow the other speakers in this series, who were Jim Guest, who's the CEO of the Consumer Union, who was our inaugural lecturer, and last year we had Dr. Steve Brobeck, who represented the CFA. And because of those three organizations, uh, the consumer movement has had a real impact in the United States. It's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Dr. Rob Mayer, the 2014 Alfred and Shirley Wampler Caldwell Lecturer. Um, you were given cards when you came in, and we'd like for you to write questions on those cards so that at the end of his talk, someone can take those up and we'll read those to him and ask, have, have some time for some questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here at Virginia Tech today. Of course, I've heard of tech my whole life, but this is my first time here in Blacksburg. And I'm very impressed by the beauty of your campus and its deep traditions. I'm thankful also as well to Irene Leach, a friend of long standing, who invited me uh, to this lecture. Uh, it's part of your year-long study of consumers and globalization. So she asked me to speak pretty much on anything I wanted that related to the consumer and international consumer policy. So I put together this talk called International Consumer Policy, Lessons in Humility, Optimism, and Caution. So as Americans, we have a lot to be proud of. We are number one in a lot of ways. This is the result of a recent study by the United Nations that created a measure that combined the quality of universities, the number of patents a country produces, and the number of scientific papers it produces, and the United States was number one. From a consumer point of view, we're number one in a lot of ways as well. We are the largest consumer market in the world. 
with slightly over 300 million people in our country, our consumer market is larger than the entire European Union, which is 28 countries and 500 million people. And with one-fourth the population of China, we still have a larger consumer market than both of those. We're number one in car ownership. And not surprisingly, we're number one in energy consumption, oil and natural gas. And our energy is cheaper than in virtually any developed country in the world. We spend more to preserve the health of our people. And we buy more books per capita than any other country. These are all things we're number one in. We're also, we have also been a leader in consumer protection around the world. The first cigarette warning was required in the United States in 1965. We were the first country to put any kind of safety regulation on cars. And today, of course, we have uh, seat belts, airbags, shatterproof glass for collision crashes, energy absorbing steer, uh, steer, steer, uh, steering wheel. Um, and we were the first country to require any of those things. And because of our requirements, other countries and around the world had to live up to the same safety standards. We were the first country in the world to protect the consumer in credit transactions. Truth in Lending Law was passed in 1968, which required lenders to give consumers a uniform, detailed way of understanding the loans they were getting. And of course, since that 1968 laws, we, law, we have passed many other consumer protection laws, including the law that gives you the right to see a free copy of your credit report once a year from each of the three credit uh, granting credit bureaus, credit reporting bureaus. How many people here have received their credit report for free, exercised this right? It's a good thing to start doing now as you start to build your credit score. We were the first country in the world way back in 1972. I realize these are before you were born, maybe before your parents were born. The first country in the world to give consumers a cooling off period, a three day period after the purchase of a good door to door to change your mind. And some places have this for used car sales as well. First country in the world. And finally, we're the first country, we were the first country in the world to deregulate our airline industry to allow airline companies to go where they wanted and to charge whatever prices they chose. Prior to 1978, airlines had to go to the government for approval on where they were going to fly and how much they were going to charge. As a result of airline deregulation, airline fares in real terms are roughly one third of what they were in 1978. Now I realize Roanoke is a relatively expensive airport to fly in and out of. But nationally, airfares are a small fraction of what they were before airline deregulation. And as a result of the United States deregulating its market, other countries around the world have gradually done the same. So these are all areas where the United States is number one. But too often, Americans see the world as though it looks like this. Or like this. So one of the things I want to do next is show you ways in which the United States has not always been the number one in terms of consumer policy. Australia was the first country in the world to require that people wear seatbelts in cars. And that goes all the way back to 1970. Believe it or not, the United States today still does not have a nationwide mandatory seatbelt use laws, use law. Different states, most of the states have a law. Virginia has what's called a secondary seatbelt use law, where if you are pulled over for some other infraction, you can be ticketed for not wearing your seatbelt, but you can't be pulled over just because you're not wearing your seatbelt. So that doesn't put a whole lot of fear into, into the minds of consumers. But of course, people have gradually begun to wear their seatbelts uh, very consistently. But we have to thank the Australians for coming up with the idea of making it mandatory. Norway was the first country in the world and remains one of only just a handful that actually has a law against sexism in advertising. Here is a US ad from the 1960s for ketchup. You mean a woman can open it? Here they are advertising their new revolutionary cap. Even a woman can open it? This kind of ad is not allowed in Norway. Why not? 
because it's derogatory toward women. If a woman is less likely to be able to figure out how to open up that ketchup, ketchup bottle than a man, hardly. And of course, lots of ads that use women as sex objects to attract attention uh, to products where a woman's body is irrelevant, like beer or airlines, are also illegal in Norway. We do not have anything like that in the United States. Sweden, in 1991, banned all ads to children under 12 on television. Do we have anything like that today? Hardly. We do not. Just turn on the television set late in the afternoon or, or of course, on Saturday morning. You can see our young children are bombarded with ads. And what's the number one thing that's advertised to young children? Food. What kind of food? Apples and carrots? High sugar, high salt, high fat foods are advertised heavily to our children. Is it a surprise that 60% of our population is overweight or obese with all that advertising to our children? I think not. Sweden, 1991, banned all advertising on TV shows directed at children under the age of 12. Canada, although we were the first country to require a warning on cigarette packages, Canada was the first country to get serious about the warning. Beginning in the year 2000, they said half of the front and the back package, front of half of the front and the back of the package has to be devoted to a scary warning like this one. And this is just one of 16 warnings that are rotated periodically. So this is one of the warnings. Here's another one, so maybe a little more relevant to women. Yes. This is the U.S. warning today. Yeah, where is it? Yeah, there it is, hiding over there. And it's almost an anti-warning, because it's, it's one of four, and it says, well, if you stop smoking now, everything will be okay, which is another way of saying, smoke as long as you want, as long as you're eventually planning to stop. Finland is one of my favorites. Finland says, if someone is speeding or driving drunk, giving them a $50 or $100 fine isn't really going to do a whole heck of a lot. So what they do is they say, especially if you're rich, so they say, okay, if you get stopped for one of these infractions, you're going to pay a fine as a proportion of your income, say 5% of your income. So if you're rich, you're going to pay a much higher fine than if you're a college student. But effectively, $100 out of the pocket of a college student is like $1,000 out of the pocket of someone who's wealthier. So in Finland, this made headlines because here's someone who had to pay over $100,000 for a speeding ticket because he made two and a half million. $100,000 for a speeding ticket. That's a society saying we are serious about our traffic laws. And finally, my favorite, as we struggle in this country to move toward renewable resources, in, a, in the production of our energy. In 2012, here's a headline in Germany. Half of the country's power demand, half on this particular day in the summer was supplied by solar power in Germany. Half. What do you think the percentage would be in the United States today on a summer day that's supplied by solar power? Half? Yeah, about a half a percent, not half, about a half a percent. So this gives us, all of these examples, give us ideas for looking at our own consumer policy and saying, do we want that or do we not want that? Now you might say, I like sexist ads. I wouldn't want to regulate them. That's fine. But looking at other countries gives us ideas for ways in which we can do better. And in that sense, I call that the lesson in humility. We are number one in, number way, in, in many ways. We have been the first in consumer policy in many ways, but not in all ways. And that's why we need to understand what's going on in other countries. What about the lesson in optimism? Here I want to turn to what's happening in the less developed countries of the world. And less developed spans quite a big range of countries, say from Somalia on the, on the lower end, uh, end to countries like Brazil, China, Mexico, whose economies have been growing and whose standard of living is quite high. But you can see the long-term trend 
in the number of people living in extreme poverty on our planet has been going down and down. Of course, the flip side of that is the number of people living in the middle class has been going up and up. This chart shows you from 1820 through the year 2006, and you can see that gradual increase in the number of people who are considered middle class, and there are many ways to define that. Looking forward, that number is expected to increase much further. Here, middle class is defined as people who earn between $6,000 a year and $30,000 a year. That would not be considered middle class in the United States, but it would be considered middle class in most of the world. And you can see the overall world projection as we go forward over the next 20, 30, 40 years is to go up and then actually go down. Why? Because there are going to be fewer people in the world ahead that far in the, in the future. And, or that's at least one projection, and therefore fewer middle class people. They're not predicting some kind of economic catastrophe. And you can see this chart shows you the world with the exception of China, the number of people who will be in the middle class. This one shows you China, and again, there's the population decrease, and then there's India. But the trend is up and up and up, and that's a very good thing. But not every kind of growth is good from the point of view of the consumer. As I mentioned before, 60% of people in the United States are overweight or obese, and that's becoming a worldwide trend. So as China has become wealthier, so has the rate of obesity increased. You can see for men in China in 2005, 34% were overweight, they're project and that would include obese. By 2015, they're projecting 57% of the men in China will be or, um, overweight or obese. And then the same trend for women, just at a slightly lower level. Mexico has a distinction. They've just passed the United States to become number one in obesity. They're slightly higher than we are. They're 61% now, overweight or obese in Mexico. That's not a distinction you want. As we'll see in a second, they're starting to do something about it. Tobacco use and deba deaths from tobacco use. That's another kind of growth that we don't want to see. These are projections in the world of the number of people who will die from tobacco. And you can see the number in the more developed countries is going, continues to go up at a slow pace. But in the less developed countries, it's going up much faster and accounts for most of this overall increase. So that's another kind of growth we really don't want to be proud of. Now, of course, having cars is the ultimate luxury, and many people around the world, that's the thing they want more than anything else. Cars are wonderful. They allow us to go where we want, when we want. They give us privacy and transportation. But of course, we know there are many problems associated with them. But it's pretty much inevitable that the number of cars on our planet is going to go up significantly in the next several decades. This just shows you by country, and this one right here, what country is that? That's China other Asian countries other than India, and that's India. So from there to there, that's more than half of the increase will, will occur in India, China, or other Asian countries. So that's good in a lot of ways, but we know there's a bunch of problems associated with having that many more cars on this planet. In individual countries, you've got the problems of congestion. Here's a picture from Pakistan, and I don't think you'd like to be caught in that traffic jam. This is the biggest traffic jam ever on our planet. It lasted 62 miles of backed up traffic for 12 days. This was in China. Now, of course, this is extreme, but it's a metaphor for what we face as a planet if we're going to have two or three times the number of cars here than we do today. And of course, another side effect of all of that is air pollution. I'm not gonna even mention global, global warming. Here's a picture of Tehran, one of the dirtiest cities in the, in the world in terms of its air. Picture from China, another country that is dealing with significant air pollution problems. And a recent study that said the number one dirtiest city in terms of air pollution in the world is New Delhi, India. Not surprising. What do Iran, China, and India have all in common? The number of cars there is exploding. 
And of course, with cars come car accidents and car deaths. So this chart shows you trends for various causes of death around the world. You can see tuberculosis down dramatically, malaria down dramatically, road traffic accidents in more developed countries like the United States, Australia, France, Germany, that's going down. But in more developed countries, the number of road accidents from 2000 to 2011 went up dramatically, and it's, design, it's project, projected to go up at an even faster pace over the next 20 years. So with all these new car ownership, we've got the problems of congestion, air pollution, and traffic accidents. So those are all things that when you look at what's happening in the less developed countries in the world, gives you reason for pause. But there are also a lot of good things that are happening there in terms of consumer policy. And I want to talk about three. One is the fact that these countries, which in the past would have looked to the United States, or looked to Sweden, or looked to Germany and said, what are you doing in consumer policy? We want to copy you. Now they're becoming new laboratories. They're experimenting on their own and becoming places where we can turn to for lessons about consumer policy. Secondly, what's going on in the less developed countries of the world is lifting the norm, what's considered normal in consumer policy around the world and therefore in the United States, and I'll say more about both of those. And then finally, there are a number of consumer problems that are not national in nature, but are international in nature. So the number of traffic accidents, that's a national problem, and you can control it with national policies. But what about things like the, uh, intellectual property protection, like the pirating of software or movies? What about things like counterfeit drugs that are sold from one country to another? What about the problem of internet fraud, which is often originates outside of the United States or any given country and is directed at its consumers. Why? Because that way you can't get to them if the police are made aware of the scam. But what about environmental problems like global warming? How can one country possibly solve that problem? It's impossible. So the third thing that's good here, and again I'll say more about this, is that as less developed countries become richer, they become better partners in tackling problems that we cannot solve on our own. So in terms of this idea of less developed countries being new laboratories for consumer policy, here's an example from Singapore. Now Singapore is a very dense country, a very urbanized country, and they have had for a long time a problem of congestion on their roads, especially in their, in their it's essentially in their cities. And so, as far back as 1975, they began a program where they would charge people tolls, not for using highways, but for entering the center city, which is, of course, where congestion was the greatest. But what they've done recently if they, is they have computerized this whole system. So as you drive your car into the city, boom, the toll gets deducted. If you are there at the peak hour of traffic, you're going to pay a higher toll. If you're driving in the middle of the night, you pay no toll. So they have used technology on top of this, uh, this novel idea of congestion pricing to try to discourage people from dri driving when the roads are most clogged and give people a financial incentive to drive at another time. They're not saying you can't drive during the congested time, but if you do choose to drive, you're going to pay a penalty for it. So is that something that might work well in Washington, D.C.? It's a pretty congested city. The roads there are pretty congested. It might work quite well there. Obesity. They're doing a number of things, but one of them is they've imposed a tax on soda. Of course, it's not, that's not the only item that makes a person obese, but it's a target it's an, and it's a symbol. And so Mexico has said, we are going to tax soda as a way of discouraging people from consuming this beverage, which is part of the problem with obesity. Do we have that in the United States? We do not. There are one or two cities that do, but definitely no states or country or a country as a whole. So this is an example of how we can look to less developed countries as they try to cope with their problems that we have as well, and then say, aha, what can we learn from Singapore? What can we learn from Mexico? Instead of Mexico saying, what can we learn from the United States? Which they do as well. The second point I made was that 
the growing wealth of the less developed countries tends to lift what's considered normal on the international stage in terms of consumer policy. So a good example of this has to do with genetically modified foods. Now this is a complex subject, whether genetically modified food is good or bad or under what conditions it should, it should uh, take place. But of course, most of the food in our food supply does contain some genetically modified foods. And there are legitimate concerns about uh, genetically modified ingredients. And there are legitimate concerns about that. But at least most countries around the world have decided that the consumer should know whether the food they're buying contains genetically modified ingredients. Anybody here from California or Washington? I know that's a long, all right, we got one, okay? The citizens of California had the opportunity two years ago to vote on whether or not they wanted labeling on their food for genetically modified ingredients. And in a very close vote, they decided no. The same with the citizens of Washington. Of course, a lot of money was spent during that campaign to convince people to vote against this. But most of the countries in the world require it. Some countries even ban the cultivation of genetically modified foods, but almost all of them require the labeling of foods. That's something that we might get to the point where we say, this is normal, this is something we ought to be doing. And of course, tobacco. There's been a sea change over my lifetime in the attitude toward tobacco. My father was a two-pack-a-day man, and he had no inkling, at least official inkling, that this was not good for him. Of course, in 1965, we had the first warning on cigarette packages here. The Surgeon General of the United States a few years earlier came out with a report saying there are definitely health problems associated with tobacco smoking. And gradually, over the ensuing decades, the world has come to the position that tobacco is, in fact, a health hazard. And we have, in fact, world, uh, world, a World Day dedicated to tobacco control. And there's a world treaty on tobacco control. So again, the world's norms have been raised with respect to tobacco control measures, like smoking in restaurants or in classrooms. When I was looking at colleges, I went around to different colleges, and there were ashtrays in the classroom, and students were smoking in the seminars. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Of course, things have changed a lot since then. So the international norm for tobacco control has been raised, and therefore it's much easier for any individual country to put in place tobacco control measures. And then the third idea is that by less developed countries becoming wealthier and having more middle class consumers, there is momentum toward dealing with these very complicated consumer problems that no individual country on its own can solve. So just for example, when we think of counterfeiting, we think of China, right? We think of people ripping off movies, music, software, etc. We think of China. But China is participating in a world treaty called the Beijing Treaty on Audiovisual Performances to put some kinds of controls on that. Why? Because China is producing more of its own audiovisual materials and doesn't want other countries ripping them off. So, because they, their consumers and their society have become more like us, where they are producers of intellectual property, they're now coming around to believing that protection of intellectual property is important. Similarly, an anti-counterfeiting trade agreement is being negotiated, and it is not yet in place, but this is multilateral action, multi-country action to deal with the problem of counterfeiting. And counterfeiting can be deadly. In the case of counterfeit movie, yeah, if you made that movie, you're not too happy about it. But if you buy a counterfeit drug that you think contains a certain amount of a key element, and that drug has been counterfeited in another country and it doesn't have that element, you can die. So counterfeiting is serious business. And again, we're working internationally to deal with this problem. The same with cybercrime, crime over the internet. You have Interpol, an international organization that is working cooperatively to deal with these problems. And once upon a time in less developed countries, people said, well, we aren't the victims of, less of internet crime. Why do we care? But as their consumers become richer and buy more things and use the internet more, now all of a sudden they're ready to join together in a network to deal with the problem. And of course, climate change. 
That's the ultimate problem that no country can deal with on its own. And a number of treaties gradually are, have been coming into place. The Kyoto Protocol being the most famous to date, but that was a, only a first step. Countries are continuing to try to negotiate international agreements where all countries will, will commit to dealing with the problem of, of climate change. Because even if the United States makes a huge effort on its own, that will make no impact on global climate change if energy consumption is dramatically increasing in countries like China, Indonesia, India, Brazil. So it's a reason for optimism to see consumers around the world becoming wealthier because now they share problems with us and they want to join with us in figuring out policies that will deal with those problems. So before we just sort of walk away into the kumbaya of, of, of it's all one world and we're cooperating very well, one final note about caution as we look to these international agreements. Trade agreements, agreements that knock down the barriers to trade among countries, are supposed to be good for consumers. Um, and they often are. Because trade agreements that knock down tariffs, knock down quotas, can lower prices for consumers, give consumers more choice over what products they can buy, because now products from other countries are available, and they stimulate innovation among all producers as they have to compete against companies not just within their own country, but from around the world. So you would think that consumer organizations would be cheerleaders for new trade, trade agreements, but they're not. In fact, consumer groups are very wary of these new trade agreements. Here's just one example. NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Agreement, which goes back 20 years now almost, among the United States, Mexico, and Canada. But this is a reference to a new trade agreement. Anyone know what TPP stands for? Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is a trade agreement that is currently be, being negotiated among countries on the eastern rim of the Pacific, like the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and countries on the western rim of the Pacific, like China, Japan, Indonesia, the Philippines, etc. So this is not very favorable, right? A lot depends on these trade agreements on whether or not there is harmonization or standardization upward or standardization downward? Is the common denominator going to be lifted to the level of the countries with the strongest protections or is it going to be dropped to the level of the countries with the weakest protections? And this is a good time to men mention Esther Peterson when we were discussing earlier. A very famous consumer advocate. Her motto was be ready to compromise but always compromise upward always push toward a high cut level of compromise. And so in the case of the European Union, which is a trading block, right? It has 28 countries in it currently, with more on the way eventually. In order to become a member of the European Union, you have to raise your consumer protection standards to the level of the highest country. Because the European Union was started by what countries? Germany, France, the Netherlands, countries that had high levels of consumer protection. So as additional countries have said, we want to be in as part of the European Union, and we want the free access to the consumers of those countries without trade restrictions, without tariffs, etc. One of the rules you have to meet is that you bring up your country's consumer protection to the level of the highest countries. So that protects the consumers in those new countries, but it also protects the consumers in those older, more advanced countries because now they're going to be seeing products produced in those other countries and they want to be able to rely on them having the same level of safety and purity as the, as the products made in their own country. So the Ukraine, which is not a member of the European Union yet, but with all the turmoil that's been going on there, one of the reasons why Putin decided to take over the Crimea was to send a message to the Ukrainians Stop messing around with this idea that you're going to join the European Union. We want you on our team, not their team anymore. 
But as late as last fall, the, Euro the Ukraine was putting in place different consumer protections that they never had before as a way of signaling to the European Union that they were serious about wanting to join the European Union. That's harmonization upward. That's good for the consumer. But there can also be harmonization downward. And that's what people are afraid of now with respect to the Trans-Pacific Partnership and also another agreement, the Transatlantic Free Trade Agreement, that's also being negotiated. Here the fear is that because the countries involved are so different in terms of their level of economic development that in creating a level playing field and a common denominator that the standards in the richer, more developed countries will be lowered to those of the poorer countries in, as part of the agreement. Because any trade agreement is designed to prevent discrimination in one country against the products of another country. So for example, the tree of origin label telling you where the meat is coming from, where the fruit is coming from, etc., you would say, is that reasonable for the consumer to want to know that? Yeah, you'd say, why not? Consumers may want to buy American products and might want to know when they're American or not American. Or they might feel that products from Japan are going to be somewhat safer than products from, um, from Malaysia. So consumers should have the right to know that. But international trade agreements don't allow that. Why not? They don't allow that because the countries who are not in the country that wants the labeling are saying that's discriminating against us. That's saying because the product was made in our country, there's somehow something wrong with it. And that consumers will steer away from that and toward your domestic product. So international trade agreements may prevent countries from requiring things like labeling of their product for where it was made or the environmental conditions under, under which the product was made. That would be illegal under most trade agreements because it doesn't have to do directly with the safety or the performance of the product. So consumer groups are very afraid right now that if there is going to be this new trade, this Trans-Pacific Partnership or this new Atlantic Agreement, that it will put downward pressure on the consumer protections that we have fought so hard for in the United States. So some final thoughts. We live in a world we're like it or not, we are totally interconnected. I heard uh, in this morning's news that there's an outbreak of the measles in Southern California. And people said, I thought we had that licked, that we didn't have measles anymore. Well, part of it is that people are afraid of the vaccinations and aren't getting them done. And part of it is because there's more and more people coming to the United States as tourists or as immigrants who are not vaccinated and who are more susceptible to these diseases and bring them with us. So if we're gonna live in a world where people move freely, where goods move freely, where investment moves freely, where ideas move freely, we're gonna to have to live with both the upside and the downside of that interdependence. So the attitude that we need to take as we look at consumer policy and living in this hyper inter interdependent world is an idea that goes back to 325 BC and the philosopher Diogenes in Greece, who was asked, where are you from? And he said, I'm not an Athenian, although he was from Athens. I'm not even a Greek. I am a cosmopolitan, that's the word in Greek. I am a citizen of the world. So as we go forward, we need to take that attitude that we're all cosmopolitans, citizens of the world. Thank you. So with or without cards, how much time do we have left? Five minutes, perfect. I don't need no stinking cards. Just Maybe I'll ask you a question.
That's a fantastic question. So to repeat it, he said, initially, a, a paraphrasing, initially airline deregulation may have been very good and, bring down pro and brought down prices, but part of competition is some people go out of business because they can't compete, and we're seeing fewer and fewer airline companies and more and more mergers, and then the question is, will we need to re-regulate? Well, there's two kinds, and I would say yes, but not the kind of regulation we used to have. Antitrust enforcement needs to be beefed up, and that's the kind that you were alluding to that doesn't seem to be very strong. The examination of these more mergers seems to always say yes. And as long as the airlines are not making healthy profits, the government will probably feel very sympathetic toward these mergers and buy the, ar buy the argument that bigger is more efficient and bigger is more uh, beneficial to the consumer. But at some point, and we may be there now, this consolidation is not beneficial to the consumer, increases prices, decreases choices. So I think that's an excellent question. We definitely need strong anti antitrust enforcement, but we don't need control of fares and routes the way we used to. I'll ask you a question. Of all the policies that I mentioned today that we don't have in the United States, but exist in other countries, which one you, would you either very much like to see considered here or definitely not considered here, one or the other. Yeah, it's got to have bite. If the point of a fine is to punish, it's got to be sufficient to punish, right? You can't just walk away from it because you're rich. So, um, and in a society with a lot of inequality, that's maybe an interesting idea. Maybe not to the point where you pay $100,000, but something that does bite. Somebody else saw something they liked or definitely don't want to see. Or for... Is, you know, the simple argument is it's the right to know. Now, the industry argument is the very fact of labeling somehow stigmatizes it. Like, why would you be telling me this um, if there was nothing wrong with it? And the scientific research suggests so far that there are no safety problems so far. Um, but many consumers say, let me make that decision on my own. If I, I would prefer to buy products without genetically modified ingredients, I need the labeling. Otherwise, I have no way of telling. Maybe a third example of something you liked or something you would not like to see. Okay, in case you didn't hear that, he said, I don't like these super graphic um, warnings that people know the dangers, it's driving the tobacco companies out of business, um, and Smokers are aware of, of the dangers. We don't need to do that. That's the position the United States has taken so far, but it's not becoming the international consensus position. So if the American tobacco company wants to sell products overseas, they've got to live up to the, the requirements of the country they want to sell in, as close by as Canada, Australia. One more minute, last question. No, I'm gonna no question. <laughs> We'll You've seen all these little buildings over here with Hokie Stone. Stone. Yeah, we've got a little chip. <laughs> well, the, the gift has been all mine to, to visit your beautiful campus and to be with you this morning. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Great.